morning, everybody. How are you guys today? Everybody good? Well, you look good. That's all I'm going to say. You guys look awesome today. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And if you're a guest with us, I can't tell you how um, much that we appreciate that and how honoring it is for us to have you guys here. I know you could be anywhere. I know there's football on. Cowboys already lost, so we got that out of the way. Just started it off. Started it off right. No, no people are going to be mentioned here, but some of you have already rubbed that into me in a dramatic way by wearing shirts of the enemy uh, that is Tom uh, Brady. Uh, so yes, yes, that's what I'm talking about. At our church, we don't say amen, we say go Cowboys. It's the same thing, same thing, yes. If you start calling out heresies in here, we're going to, ushers, if anybody says nothing, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hey, listen, um, obviously, by the way, my name is Danny Rivers, and I'm one of the pastors here at LifePoint. Thank you again. Thank you for being here. Those of you who are with us online, uh, man, it means so much, because I know, especially you, you could be doing anything in your own house right now, but you're here, you're gathered around. Hey, LifePoint family, can we welcome all of our folks that are, are hanging out with us online? Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, yesterday was a very significant day for us as a country, uh, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and I know that many of you um, did your stuff yesterday, you memorialized, you remembered, and uh, I just felt like it would be remiss if I didn't say um, a little something about it. Um, and honestly, this moment in our history, the, the 20th anniversary has kind of um, inspired me a little bit to, to this new series that we're starting today. And do you remember where you were um, on that day? Do you remember that? Some of you aren't old enough to remember that. Um, some of you weren't born yet, which makes the rest of us feel super duper phenomenal about ourselves at this point in the game. Um, I think we all do. Anybody who's old enough to remember that fateful day remembers exactly where they were. When they first heard, when they first saw, uh, my wife and I were living in Mississippi. Um, we had found a 12 or 13 inch TV. Do you guys remember those? That's smaller than your laptop, but um, we found it in the office and we put it on our, our, our entertainment center, uh, also known as an ironing board. And um, <laughs> we were rich, you guys. Uh, you know, but it was like you can iron your clothes and, you know, see what's happening on Good Morning America or whatever your deal is. And, and so there we were, and I saw, I think my wife actually got me first and said, look, look what's happened. And I went in there, and of course, we know how it went down. We know the trauma of that moment. We know that 2,977 Americans perished that day, many of whom actually were running to the flaming buildings, um, not from them. Um, because they're brave men and women, first responders. And uh, we remember them. And, and by the way, if, if you're a first responder in this room or if you're with us online, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> Genuinely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know there's so many people who serve in so many ways, but um, this this weekend is about remembering those brave men and women who did that. And I, I don't think it's, I think it's fitting that we never forget, that we always remember those people um, because yesterday many of them were traumatized afresh and new, whether it was PTSD or whether it was just re remembering dad that's not here or mom that's not here or, or brother or sister or child. Um, so I want to remember another part of that story. Do you remember the days after that do you remember how we started rallying together, not only as a country, but as, as, a, as, con, as uh, citizens, as members of neighborhoods or communities, how we started texting or calling friends and family and loved ones, checking on people? Do you remember the days, if you were, if you were in the church business, when churches were full of people we hadn't seen in a long time and they were, they were there praying and crying out to God for our country when we all laid aside our differences and, and we rallied around our country and we raised money and we gave of our income and we gave blood and we called and we texted and we checked in and we prayed and we prayed for people. And remember that? Do you remember that? 
that, that in, there, were, there was a time when crisis would come, that tragedies would happen, that we knew how to neighbor. We knew how to be good neighbors, and we knew how to come alongside of people that we needed, uh, even if we had never met them before. In that time, strangers became neighbors instantly. In fact, men and women ran to the aid of strangers because they were their neighbors and because that was their job, that was their duty. They ran to strangers because they were neighbors and they knew how to neighbor. And we catch little glimpses of this. Hurricane Ida, some of you went over there. Some people in our church went there and we sent funds and tornadoes strike and we know we neighbor. But if I'm being honest, man, over the last 19 months or so, it started before that, but it's, it's exacerbated that, that already tenuous situation. We have not neighbored well. Come on, be honest. Just be honest. We have not neighbored well. Um, we have drawn um, our, our, our blinds closed. We have shut our doors. We have gone inward. Um, we t- they told us to, so we did what we were supposed to do because that was what we were told was the safest thing. And, and, and I get it, and I know why we did that, but we... We haven't learned how to come back out and be neighborly again and be good neighbors. Even forget the differences. Forget the, all of the various differences because they're myriad. Am I right? Come on, there's a new one every day to remind us why we're different from each other. But we laid all that down. And so I'd like to, I'd like to remember 9-11 in this new way of remembering the weeks after. And I want to talk to us for the next few weeks from one passage of Scripture mostly Um, about how to neighbor. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 10. While you're looking, I want to pray, okay? Do that. Father, I thank you um, for all of the families and all the people who who surrendered much for, for those people there all around the country, God. I pray for them today, God, as they're as they're going through this season of remembrance and it brings up new and fresh pain, but it also reminds them of what honor looks like and what sacrifice and duty look like. And I pray that some of that, that would come back to us, at least those of us who call uh, Jesus Lord and Savior, that we would get a hold of that afresh and new. God, I pray that the scriptures, however feebly I present them, that they would find root in this place, good soil, Like Colossians 3.16 says, let the words of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom. Let that be true of us, I pray today in Jesus' name. Everybody says a good amen, would you? Today I'd like to visit um, a very old story from the New Testament. It's a story that was told to us by Jesus. Jesus would often use a mechanism uh, for teaching that had been used for generations, centuries really, by the, the rabbis of their time. The first instance that I can find of, of a parable being used is, is all the way back, and I think it's in Second Samuel maybe, where Nathan, the prophet Nathan, confronts David who sinned against his wife, against his family, against another man, had him killed, took his wife, and, and, and Nathan comes and presents a parable uh, about a rich man and a poor man who had a sheep, And that's the first instance that I can recall. There may have been earlier ones, but it had been used for generations. And this particular parable that Jesus tells, where where a parable is a story that you would create, craft, intentionally to help a person to draw people into a story. This one's called the Good Samaritan. Have you you heard of this story? Most, I think, folks have. Do, Do you remember the characters in the story? Um, The the characters in Jesus' stories are always very important. Uh, Because Jesus means for us, and most often, not always, but most often, to have us identify with one of them, right? And so, to the extent that we would say, one of them is clearly God, and one of them is probably me. And then that there would be a hook in the story that would cause us to say, well, what am I going to do now that I realize who I am, who God is, what's my response to that? That's the, that was always and forever will be the purpose of parables, is to create a word, picture that draws us in to create movement in our lives. Not a moment, but, but movement. And I, I'd love for you to do that over these next few weeks to, to identify with one of the characters. There's the priest. There is his uh, kind of assistant, the Levi, the Levite. And there is the Good Samaritan. And of course, there's the traveler that we know about that, that falls amongst 
thieves, there's the robbers, there's the innkeeper, there's even a donkey. It's like a Shrek movie. Can I get a witness to that? Uh, amen. So, verse 25, on, on one occasion, verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law, so the expert in the law would have been somebody who knew the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, and all of the sort of man-created laws and statutes that went along with it. This is, he's an expert in that. He stood up. Uh, Jesus is teaching. He stands up, and he walks up to Jesus, and he, he's come to test him. So we know right away he's not, he's not a learner. He has come to say, let's just see how much you know, because he knows a lot. He's an expert. Let's see how much you actually know. So he asks him, teacher, which is a sign of respect. Thankfully, he does that. What must I do to inherit eternal life. Now, there's much here that I can't get into. Hopefully, I can get into it over the next few weeks, but there's much here. What can I, what must I do? Now, Jesus' answer should have been, right, believe on me, trust me, put your faith, surrender to me, follow the leader, my leadership all throughout your life, because that's the right answer, right? And Jesus will say that, and he will have disciples that will come along in Acts and, and, and all through the epistles and say the very same thing. But the answer is not so black and white as it seems with this particular man. For a Jewish person in the time, particularly an expert in the law, the idea of salvation was that you just simply obeyed all of the laws uh, of the Old Testament. There were 600 plus of these laws. And, and so then, then in the Jewish tradition, there would be different factions. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, 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 the temple elite, and, and all of them would have various ways that they would put emphasis on certain parts of the scripture. And we, we see this now, like, like we're a non-denominational church, but we have people who are Baptist here in the room, and, and Baptists place special emphasis on baptisms. Uh, we have Pentecostals in the room. That's the way I grew up. That was the tradition I grew up in. I've told you about that before. Uh, and, and we would grow up placing serious emphasis on what happened in the book of Acts, what happened on the day of Pentecost, and the day, of course, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, you have people like uh, Presbyterians. They're known for being very quiet in church. And so uh, we have a lot of Presbyterians here today, apparently. Uh, but it's all good, man. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> Kidding if you're a Presbyterian. And just, they do have quiet church. Um, we, on the other hand, don't. That's why we have little orange foam things that you can jam in your ear because it's too loud, right? Anyways. Sometimes kids think they're candy corn, especially around Halloween, but they're not. Just FYI. Look, mom, a bowl of candy corn. You know, and it's like, that's not going to be healthy for them. Uh, anyways, I've made that known, so now you can't sue us if that actually happens, all right? So, so, so this expert in the law wants to know, okay, so you're this new rabbi, everybody's raving about you, all the miracles you do. Let's see what you know. Let's see which of these laws you emphasize particularly as it relates to what it looks like to inherit eternal life. They didn't think of eternal life as heaven like you and I do because they didn't have John the Revelator. They didn't have, and I, John, saw the he a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw a wall. They didn't have that. Like, really, it was just obey the law so that when you die, you can have peace with God, right? Go study the Old Testament. There's not much like heaven, and there's, it's, it's, that's a New Testament construct, right? So... So he, he, here's what he says. Instead of answering him, he says, okay, like smart guy, what, what do you think? Jesus would always do this. When, when, the, when they would come to test him and they did this over and over again, he'd ask them, what do you think? So, of course, this is a, this is a softball for this guy. He says, um, uh, he says, what is written in the law? How, how do you read it? And the expert in the law says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. There's four things there. If you want to study that later, go look at each of those four things. That's the first and greatest commandment. And love your neighbor. Um, the word would be as much as you love yourself. So Jesus says, right answer, right? Because Jesus himself said that these were the two great commandments. Another guy asked him, what's the great commandment? He says, these are them. He, Jesus goes on and adds an, a, a sort of caveat, and he says, and all of the Old Testament, with all of its laws and prophet, prophetic writings, they all are hanging on this, this construct here. Like, none of that matters unless you get this part right. Love God, love your neighbor, you've gotten it right. So, sounds like, okay, two things we've got to worry about, that's easy, but it's not so easy. 
Let's see how many of us are truth tellers. The last two gatherings, not many were. Come on, we just exposed the congregation as all the non-truth tellers that we are, right? You're welcome. Thanks for coming to Life Point. We just want to lift you up and encourage you <laughs> in the Lord. So how many of you have someone in your life that you find it very difficult to love? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Now don't look at them. Don't look at them like, it's you. It's not helpful. It's not how Jesus wants us to be. Talking about how to be a good neighbor, not divide you, right? Like, we all know people that are hard to love. They disappoint you. They gossip about you. They break your heart. They let you down. They oppose your political views. And this is just your kids, right? Just, we're just starting with your own kids. It's bad. It's bad. I love the kids. The, the religious expert, and, and, and in fact, many people even today were legalists. They were about the letter of the law. They were about crossing the, 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 the T's and dotting the I's, and they missed the spirit of the law. You remember when we taught uh, through the Gospel of Mark that, that this is the problem. This was the tension with Jesus. You, yeah, you understand the law, but you miss the heart of it. You miss the whole heart. And so this is, this is what's happening. So they, they were like, you, you only earn, quote, earn the grace of God by following all the rules. Exactly. That's hard. But you know what's harder? Loving people that are unlovable. Forgiving people who've hurt you. Sacrificing your good um, for the good of other people. That's hard. In fact, I would say, apart from the work that God does in our, heart, in our lives, it's impossible. And yet, Jesus says, You've answered right when you say you're supposed to love your neighbor just like you do yourself. That's hard. But, well, at least we've come so far now, whether you don't get anything else, we know what Jesus says is the most important of the law, right? What do I need to do? What do I need to know? Love God, love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. You've answered correctly, Jesus says, do this and you will live. So, so you would think maybe the expert starts to feel the tension here, and he goes, you know what, Lord, honestly... I'm, I haven't followed all the rules correctly. I, I, I tell people that I have. I want people to believe that I have. I'm an expert in the law, but I don't love my neighbors as much as I do myself. I, I find that very hard. I need, could you do something in my heart that would help me do that? But the expert of the law doesn't ask that, doesn't say that. He wants something else. And so he says, he says but he wanted to say this with me. He wanted to justify himself. What he wants to do is he wants to shrink the pool of who his neighbor is. Now, I know none of you have ever done that. Like, who do I have to love so I can go to heaven, right? Shrink the pool. The people who think like me, look like me, vote like me, act like me, eat enchiladas that I like. Come on, drink Big Red and Carnizada after church every Sunday. Those are the neighbors. Anybody who, disp cowboy fans, anybody else. Spurs fans, can I keep going? Rangers fan, God, I have no people that are good anymore. Pray for me, man. The Longhorns got killed by some pigs yesterday. Come on, cows don't lose the pigs. Razorbacks, anybody? If you're from Arkansas, I'm sorry. You're not a pig, but your team is pigs. You sing a song called Suey Pig. It's the third gathering. I'm just taking my time. You're like, shouldn't you be almost wrapping it up right now? I should, according to the clock, but I'm not even close. Here we go. <laughs> You're tired. I'm tired. I've been up here all day. Anyways. <laughs> so, so he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Right? Does he want the answer? No. He wants to do what all the rabbis in the tradition were doing, which was make lists of who's not, who's in and who's out. Right? Religious people still do this. It's like, oh, these kind of people can't go to heaven because they don't look like this. They don't do this. They don't do that. And Jesus would say, he says in John 10, I have sheep that you don't even know of. You think all oh, you are the sheep. I got some people you don't even know. You're going to get to heaven and go, why are you here? And they're going to be going, why are you here? Can I get a witness, somebody? Right? There's going to be some folks there. And you're, oh, sorry. Anyways, I got to go. I got to keep going because that's not part of the sermon. So, so the rabbis would go, okay, only Jewish people are in, are my neighbors. Go read it. It's true. But someone would be stricter and say, no, 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 not, not, not even just Jewish people. It has to be Jewish people who obey all of the laws. Anybody who's different or other than, go read Leviticus. Go read Deuteronomy. Anybody who's different or other, you're out, right? Which is why Jesus 
does a whole new thing. And so, so certainly a Roman citizen wouldn't be your neighbor, right? They, they occupied us. They took us over. Wouldn't be a Gentile. Wouldn't be anybody who's a non-Jew. That, that's, of course, they can't be our neighbors, right? And we see this, right? Can't, can't be, it can't be a, a, uh, 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 a Samaritan for sure because we hate those guys, right? So he wants to justify himself. Th- those of you who are in high school, those of you who are in college or you've been, you, you've done this, I've done this, right? We ask our teacher as they're rambling on and on, is this going to be on the test? Come on, come on, with me, right? Do I, should I be writing this down? I just need to know because what we, we don't want to learn this stuff, right? I don't care about this. This ain't going to be part of my job. D- should I write this down? Is this going to be on the test? Right? Because if it's not on the test, I'm going to go back and put my AirPods on and play this game I was playing. Because what do we want to know? We want to know whatever it takes to get past the test so we can get the grade we need to go on to the next level. And see, here's the thing. We do this all the time with God's word and Jesus' teachings. I don't actually want to grow, Danny. I don't actually want to be transformed. I don't want to be challenged. Just give me some stuff. Tell me that I'm good so I can check off my box. I can go about my business. I don't want to change my life. I want to know just enough so I can justify myself so that when I die, I know what the minimum entrance requirements for gaining heaven when I die. But Jesus never tells us what the minimum entrance requirements are. He doesn't even focus on that at all. Go read it. He doesn't focus on what is the minimum. Matter of fact, he starts to set really high bars along the way. Not because salvation is hard, but because following Jesus can be. Right? Yes or no? Right? You're like, I'm not sure yet. Should I say yes? Right? So he wants to justify him. So he says, who is my neighbor? So Jesus launches off into this story. And he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem, going down because Jerusalem is uh, almost three-fourths of a mile in elevation, like vertical elevation above Jericho. Like this is a serious 20 uh, 20 miles, 33 kilometers-ish. Some people say it's different. So he's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by, by robbers, right? This is a known road. The road to Jericho is a known road. It, 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 it was a normal path of transportation centuries before Jesus' time, still is even right now. And, and, and in the Jewish mind, it was often the hated Samaritans um, who were the people attacking them on the road back and forth because Jerusalem, the temple's there. So if I live in Jericho and I'm Jewish, I've got to go up once a year, offer my sacrifices, which means I have to take some money up because I've got to buy a dove or I've got to buy a cow or I've got to buy a sheep, whatever. And so the, the robbers would know this. They would lay wait. They would take them out. And when they're coming back, sometimes, sometimes merchants would go up the same path with the cows, with the stuff, and they would sell. So they'd come back with money. So it was a known road and it was dangerous. So... A priest happened to be going down the same road, Jesus says. And when he saw the man, now remember, this is a priest, a man of God, a man of the cloth, righteous, good, and ostensibly, right? He's probably fairly wealthy because there was generational income that had been passed down through, through the centuries to the priest, so he probably wasn't walking on foot. He's probably walking, he's on a donkey. It's like a Shrek story. There's a donkey there. And so what does he do? What does he do? He passes by on the other side. Now, in my mind, the way this always worked is I, like, I think of, of America. We have roads, they're wide, and sometimes I'll see a wreck on the other side of the road. You've seen this, you slow down, ah, oh, and you keep going, right? And so I think this is what this guy did. Oh, there's somebody over there hurt. But I want to show you something real quick. Can, I, can we get, this is the road to Jericho right here. This is it. Uh, if you ever go there, these are tourists there. You can see them mostly. It's tourists that use this road now. They, they hike this trail. If you ever walk on there, you're walking on the same road. You see it snaking along the outer left-hand bank. It's like, hey, mom, can we stop and smell the flowers? No, you'll die. <laughs> They're on the other side of the cliff. Could just leave that up, leave that up, because I, 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 I want people to actually just go back one, right? Like, that's just, there's, passing by the other side means that he, he literally decided to go I don't have time for that. You with me? So, so, so imagine, and some of you will have to imagine harder than others. Imagine you're hiking in Arizona in the mountains in the desert in the dry places. Come on, somebody like, nope, not gonna do it, not gonna make me. Imagine you did though, right? And you're and you're hiking along a trail just like that one. It's narrow, and and there's a person laying in the in the trail, like in the trail. They're bloody, they're hurt. Maybe they fell down from the switchback above. Maybe they got attacked by a mountain lion, and you're there, and you're like, there's nobody around. 
We're, we're 15 miles from the nearest place. I, what are we going to do? And imagine that your response is, yeah, I don't, I'm, I don't know what to do about that, bro. I'm sorry. And you go on. Are you one of the good people? So, so, so do you, are you with me now? You have the, the picture in your mind of what's going on here? Now, why doesn't he help? Jesus doesn't tell us. Maybe it's because he's a priest and priests weren't allowed to touch people who were dead. Maybe he thinks he's dead. They were also not a touch, allowed to touch people who were issuing blood in some manner of speaking, um, except that there was a law that said if it's, if it's between them and their death, if the, it was a law, like the law of life or whatever it was, I can't remember it now, then you're allowed to jump in. You're not breaking the law. So Jesus makes sure we know by implication that this isn't a good thing that he did. But there's another man on the road. Second man, what will he do? So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, he did the same thing. Religious guy, he's probably assisting the priest. He probably knows the priest is on the trail. So probably he's going in his mind, well, he didn't do anything about it. Why, do I, why am I going to do that? Or, or, or maybe, or maybe, or maybe, he says, man, this road is, this road is bad. This road is trouble. This is a real problem we've got here. This road is a mess. People are getting hurt. People are getting broken. But, but man, this is a bigger problem than me. What am I supposed to do about this? This is, this is a huge societal issue. I, I don't have time to do anything about this. I'm going to step over this and hope the next person knows what to do about the problems in the country and the problems in the world. I can't do it because this is too big for me. Does that make sense? Both of these guys have this moment where they see him. The King James says that the priest came and looked upon him. The, the King James says that the Levite just passed around him, like didn't even go look at him. It's like at least the priest went and looked on him, but the, 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 the challenge for both of them was, what is this gonna, how is this going to affect me? What is this going to cost me? And my schedule is busy. I'm tired. I got no money. I got no time. I got, no, I got things to do. This is all important because we're one of these characters in the story. Yes? You with me? So Jesus says then in verse 33, but a Samaritan in the room gets really quiet, whatever the room is that he's in, because they're in a room, because, or they're in a place where there's people gathered and they're quiet, because we know the experts stood up and went and talked to Jesus. And some of you know why the room gets quiet in this moment, because Samaritans were the most hated people in Israel. Samaritans were Jews who had assimilated in ancient times with the Assyrian Empire and all of their religious and idolatry, their idolatrous practices, and they became the enemies of the Jewish people. And they were considered worse than tax collectors and Romans. They were the worst of the worst. And the division and the hostility between the two of them had gone all the, way to, all the way back to the time of the divided kingdom. So when John, matter of fact, when John is telling about Jesus' interaction with a Samaritan woman, there's a part where Jesus tells his disciples, we must go to Samaria. I got to go through Samaria. Well, nobody goes through Samaria. Jewish people don't go through Samaria, but Jesus does. So John is like, while he's telling the story of Jesus' interaction at a well with a Samaritan woman, he, he writes parenthetically. Here's what he says. He said, Jew, this is verse 9, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Like he's not willing, he's not, he's not comfortable just telling the story. He has to make sure that the readers see Jews did not do this. What Jesus did, we don't do this. This is how deep the hostility is. So, so but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, same exact thing. When he came to him, he saw him, but there's a difference. He took pity. He just had compassion on him. Now, all three of them saw the same thing. Come on, we're talking about how to neighbor. All three of them saw the very same thing, but they all did something different. The Samaritan came, he saw but he didn't just see, he was moved with compassion on him. He didn't pass by. He got to work, and then he just kept doing stuff. Verse 34, he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, so he looks through his pack on his donkey, he finds a cloth, tears up some of the cloth, and wraps around this. No Jewish person would have done this. He wraps it around him. Well, certainly not a, a priest. And, and then he finds oil and wine, which he would have needed for the journey. And what does he do? He pours in the oil and the wine to wash his wounds. What's he doing here? He's just doing what he could with what he had. Are you with me? I don't know what to do about the problems of the society. I don't know what to do about this road to Jericho. It's too big of a problem for me. 
He was just doing what he could with what he had. They could have done the same thing, but they passed by. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn. We'll talk about that next week. Took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, or denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Each one of these represents a full day's work, so it's, a, it's quite a bit of money. Gave him to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. He's probably going to sell things in the temple. We find this as a part of the New Testament. He's going to come back with more money now, and he's like, hey, if, you, if, you, if it costs any more, I'll, I'll pay it then. I'll have more money. Let's just think about where we are so far in the story, and you're like, you're going to summarize? You just took an hour to tell us this part of it. You know what I'm saying? Just, uh, he, okay, here we go. Traveler's going down. Let's put it in modern context. A traveler's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and meets the bad guys. Everybody knows there's bad guys in the movie, right? They're, they're bad guys, so they do what bad guys do. They rob people. They rob him. They beat him. They leave him half dead. He's not, he's not all dead. He's just only mostly dead because he's from the Princess Bride. Anyways, but then he meets the good guys, right? He meets the good guys. Uh, the priest, the Levite, and what do good guys do? They help, they show up, they get off their, their, their donkey, and they show compassion, right? No, no, the priest and the Levite, the good guys, they go out of their way to avoid helping the man. And, and then when we meet another bad guy who's supposed to do bad things, the Samaritan, what does the Samaritan do? The bad guy do? The Samaritan actually goes out of his way to help the injured man. And so see the priest and the Levites, catch this, please. They're treating a neighbor like a stranger, but the Samaritan is treating a stranger like a neighbor, and that makes all the difference in the world. And the text says he has compassion. And the word compassion in the Greek, I can't pronounce it because I don't know Greek and it's hard to say. All right, so just, just know that it's a hard word. But it means colloquially, it means visceral or from the gut. So, so let's go back to the road again. Have you ever been driving down the road I remember coming out of Alamo Ranch right over here years ago, about four or five years ago when we lived right there. I come out on the road and I see a guy on his bike and he's dead. They have a yellow tarp over him and I can see his socks. He has my same bicycle, Cannondale, and, and I see it mangled there and I just see him dead and it just, oh, God. From the, do you know what I'm saying? From the gut. It makes you sick. It makes you nauseous. He sees a stranger, but he doesn't see a stranger. He sees a neighbor. He doesn't see all of the differences because Jesus doesn't put a color of skin on this guy. He doesn't tell us what nationality the, 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 the guy on the road was. He just said, here he was walking down the road, and he sees this person, and he thinks, I got it. He feels compassion from the guy. Got Somebody's got to do something. I can't fix all the problems on the road to Jer Jericho, but I can do something. So he just does for one what he wishes he could do for all. Andy Stanley says, do for one what you wish you could do for all. Oh, I don't know how to fix all the problems in America. I don't know how to do this, so that for, therefore I, I absolve myself of having to do anything. No, 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 no. Do for one, this is, this, this is a lesson that we're learning about how to neighbor. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do something. So the Samaritan says, he's my neighbor. So, so who's your neighbor? Who's your one person? MLK, Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached this text, and he said, he said the Levite and the priest went down, they saw him, and all they could think about is how's this going to affect me? He says, but then the Good Samaritan came by and reversed the question, not what, what will happen, not, not what will happen if I stop to help this man, but what will happen to this man if I don't stop to help him? That's how you neighbor. Not how does this affect me, but what happens if I don't, if somebody doesn't do something, what happens? Does that make sense? Like this, this whole message is probably a big old mess and I hope it is not. I'll never finish it because I haven't finished even close at any point today. But here's the thing. People are mad in our country. People are divisive in our country. People are hurt in our country and hurt people hurt people, right? We have to see that. People are in pain. They're confused. They're looking for new ways to get offended every day, something new to be offended about. I get it. It's a tough world right now. It's tough for every one of us, but God has called us out of darkness, everybody, and into his marvelous light, and he's called us to be bright light and salt in the world, not to just blend in, not to just go, hey, if you can't beat them, join them, do something, right? This is the thing. And I'm not, I'm not talking down to you. I'm talking to Danny. Danny, do something, bruh. Matthew 5, I don't have it on the screen, but 
Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You, you, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others. And, and the King James says, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Listen now, pay attention. See your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. They see you and they are attracted to God because of you. So then, so then, thank you. So, so your work matters. The tone of your email matters. The conflicts, the meetings, the managing. This is your mission. Your own neighborhood with the quirky neighbors who do weird things to their front door and put weird stuff all over their yard, right? Come on. The way that they don't know how to plant anything, they just put it in pots all across their yard. Oh God, I actually called out one of my own neighbors today. If he sees this, I love you, brother. And, and we, we can't, like, 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 like in your, your, this is your mission, your, your, your local coffee shop, your, your local H-E-B, it's always packed. There's plenty of neighbors in there. Come on, can I get a witness to that? The, 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 your classmates, your teachers, your students, your social media friends, your family, they're your mission. The question is, are you going to choose? How does this affect me or how will it affect them if I don't do this? This is the hook in Jesus' story. Let me close with one thought. I have 12. Let me, let me close with one Proximity. Just, just, let me just give this because I want to I nail down what I just said deep, all right? I want to dig. So, so the word in, in Hebrew uh, is just near to. Na the word neighbor in Hebrew is just near to, right? So what does that mean? That means everybody you come in contact with is your neighbor. So that's the way we do it. But let, let me say, if that's true. But if everybody is your neighbor, you'll be like the priest and the Levite and say, it's too big. Nobody's my neighbor. If everyone is my neighbor, then I don't feel any responsibility. There will be no onus on me to do anything. Yes or no? So, so what about your actual neighbors? Do you have people on the right and the left and the front and the back? Come on, if you're in an apartment, you got them up, down, sideways, just like the Brady Bunch, and you're all looking at each other in a box. Come on. I've lived in these bad boys. They're awesome. You don't know who. You're, there's some smells that you're going to smell. They're like, they cook different kind of food than I do. Come on. Could I have some? Right? It smells awesome. <laughs> right? But check this out. You're in proximity to them because God designed it that way. What? No, okay. All right. So I'm going I'm to show you a text. Promise done. Four more minutes. Um, Acts chapter 17. This is the Apostle Paul. He has rolled into a town called Athens. You've heard of it. It's in Greece. This is a famous place uh, called Mars Hill. There is a building there called the Areopagus. This is where the philosophers of the age would come, and, and their whole goal was to learn some new thing. So they could take it back to all of their various places they're from and go, hey, hi, at the Areopagus, I heard. So Paul stands up at the Areopagus. He preaches the, one of the great sermons probably ever preached in human history. He's a lot shorter than me, uh, not in stature, but in preaching. And he knows a lot more than me, so that's a problem for me. Anyways, but in the par process of the sermon, he says, from one man, he has made every nationality. Is that a call to unity, yes or no? From one man, everybody came to be. So somewhere along the way, you're my brother from another mother and a father. Come on, can I get a witness to that? Somewhere along the way. And by the way, Ephesians says that he took all these disparate groups and made them one group. So when you're a believer, it doesn't matter what color you are or what your background is or what your nationality is. We are family. Yes, yes. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth like God did this. And what, what has he done? He has determined there are appointed times, meaning, meaning, all right, I'm not going to call my child because she'll hate me if I do that. L right, so meaning, I'm not going to call anybody. I'm just going to leave everybody alone. Like, wh whoever you are, God puts you here. In the, on the, on, so on the continuum of history, right, from beginning to end, you are all here in this moment because God ordained it. He appointed it. He determined there are appointed times where you were going to live. Your great, great, great grandfather, God decided that's when that guy's showing up. Ephesians 2, right, it says that he determined long ages ago, um, he, he wrote a script for us all, basically, that we should walk in it, he says, and, and he's determined that we're going to do good things. So he determined their appointed times, and look at this, and the boundaries of where they, what, live. Now, he's talking about nations and states, of course he is, but God is not the God of just the big picture, he's the God of the granular level, right? Don't, 
Read the Bible and tell me he's not the, pick, the, the God of the, of, the, of the details. He knows the hairs on your head. So he, he put this, and, and so why did he do this? He did this so that they might, the people, the nations, all the people around us might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each of us. So let me, just, let me just break this down. Andy's in the room. I'm going to pick on Andy. Andy is, his parents were born a long time ago, longer than me because I'm younger than them. Praise Jesus. <laughs> um, his mother is my sister. I'm three years younger than her, and I'll never stop telling her this. Um, so Andy came to be because God appointed Andy to be, and then his mom and dad got married, and then God helped them have Andy, and Andy was born in this neighborhood, and, and he was born in this neighborhood because God appointed it, he appointed it, and he put neighbors around Andy so that Andy, when he goes off to school, he has to go to, what, he has to, go to the school that's there, right? We're, we're appointed where to go. So now you might skip and cheat and go around to another school. You like it better, but this is what happens. You, and, and, and what happens is when Andy's at school, when he's a kid and he's at school, Somewhere along the way, God has a neighbor or a friend or a person around his, in his, his neighborhood that's going to bump into him one day, and maybe they're, maybe, I'm just going to paint a picture, maybe they're going, I don't know if I want to live anymore. But Andy, because Andy's the nicest guy you'll ever meet, and Andy's always got a smile, and Andy's kind to people, um, sometimes. Can, can I get a witness, students? Sometimes the students will be like, no, he can be pretty abrasive too because he tells it like it is. Andy tells it like it is. So anyways, so, so, so he comes up to him and he's like, bro, what's up? And he hugs him out and he's like, dude, we got to hang. And, and he, Andy has no idea. He has no idea that he's just been used by God. And this person goes, well, maybe there is somebody who thinks I'm cool. Maybe there is somebody. And so this person decides, I want to live. And listen, listen, listen. Because Andy was appointed by God to live in this house, to live in this neighborhood, to go to that school, to rub shoulders with that person. Somebody's life gets changed, and maybe somebody goes, what's different about Andy? Let your light so shine that people might see your good deeds and glorify your God in heaven so that he did this so that they might seek God, and perhaps because they see you, they see the God in you, and they say, I want to know the God you know because he's changed your life so dramatically that you're kind. The world's crazy. The world's mad. Everybody's angry, but you're not. Something's different about you. And it's, it's, Paul's not painting a picture that you're searching for God in the cosmos. God, I'm broken, God. I've been attacked on the side of the road. God, I don't, who do I go to, God? Paul says he's not far from any one of us. So that if you'll reach out just even a little bit, he's close. But listen, listen, listen. Sometimes he's close because he's on the inside of you and you are near to them. So the way they find God sometimes, oftentimes, is through you. Yes or no? So, the Good Samaritan, it's a fake person in a fake story, but it paints a vivid picture. Do you want to be with the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? Who, Jesus says, he goes on, I don't have time, he says, who then is the neighbor? And, and, the, and, and the, the, the guy says, he can't even say the Samaritan, he says, the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus says, go and do likewise. You have a, you heard a message today. It was messy and goofy and weird. But the hope, the hope is for me is not that you go, I learned something new today. That's not the hope. The hope is that you, life point, you, follower of Jesus, would say, I got to respond to this. Every picture that Jesus paints is like a funnel. Go read the, good, the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount. It's all at the back end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's a wise person, a foolish person, a person who builds their house on the rock, a person who builds their house on the sand. And all of it's funneling people to make a decision. Will the listener, will they choose to follow Jesus or will they turn their back and say, no, I'm going to go my own way. I, I hate to put this on you, but that's where we're at right here in this moment. Will you say, yes, I will not get sucked in 
to the anger and the animosity and the politicking and, and the cruelty and the ugliness and the yuck. I will not get sucked into that. Sometimes it will trigger me and I will want to, come on somebody, I will want to cut somebody for Jesus. But I'll put the knife away, man. I'll put the knife away and I'll use it to cut strips so that I can bind up. Come on, I'll use it. Come on, there's a use in the knife somehow, y'all. I'll cut some strips and I'll bind them up and I'll stop the bleeding. Come on, stop the bleeding. And the country's bleeding, everybody. And we're like, it's too big. Just do what you can with what you got. Yes? And do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. In that way, you and I will start learning how to neighbor like Jesus did. Can I get an amen from somebody? Yeah. It's a big old mess, this message, and I'm, as normal, I'm over time. I'm hanging my head in shame so that you guys will know that I feel ashamed. Would you hang your head in reverence? <laughs> Lord, I don't, I hope this made sense, Lord. I hope that somebody feels a tug. I hope somebody feels tension. Lord, it's easy just to preach a message that makes everybody feel good. They go out and they eat carnisada, big red, and they feel good. And they watch some team lose to the Cowboys by faith in Jesus who shed his blood for us, our sins, and died. But Lord, I'm praying, honestly, I'm praying that we would be faced with a decision. James says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. May we be the kind of believers who don't go home going, hey, that was something to think about but may we be the kind of people who think about it while we're doing something. Would you help us, I pray, Jesus. And God, for those, for those people who are here today who don't know Jesus, but who, who would say, Danny, I often would say I identify most with the person beaten up. God, as I was thinking about the person who got beat up, I, I couldn't stop weeping yesterday because... There have been moments even recently where I felt beat up. I felt abandoned or forgotten by friends or whatever. I think for, as Matthew 11 says, for the kingdom to break out of us with power, it's just important that we remember people are broken and maybe they say what they say and do what they do because they're hurting or they're confused or they're in pain. And God, if I can identify with the broken man along the road, I think... I can understand what motivates a Samaritan to do what he did. Because probably what he thought was me too. But I've been there. I've been broken down. I've been hurt. I've been attacked. God, would you put it in us to care enough to have compassion in our guts that moves us to action, I pray, to neighbor to neighbor. Some of us will call, be called to do big things in ministry somewhere, maybe, maybe be missionaries, but most of us are going to be called right where we are because you set the boundaries and the ha- the, uh, that where we'll live, the habitations, the King James says. You set that up. You appointed it. You put us here to do something. May we never be bench warmers. May we never sit on the bench. May we get involved. May we get involved in the dream team or may we, may we lead a group or or may we, may we plug in with one of our many missions partners here in this city to see the world change one person at a time. And God, for those who are here today who would identify with the broken man, Jesus, you are the ultimate good Samaritan who came from heaven to earth, who saw us, God, broken by sin, damaged beyond our hope. And you built a bridge called the cross that we could walk over because you sacrificed your life on a cross. You poured in the oil and the wine from your own blood. It was poured out for for the healing of our own lives, of our own souls, of our own brokenness. God, for those of us who are broken, may we look to you, Jesus. As you bandage us up, as you pour us out the oil and the wine, and then as you take us and you put us in an inn, which I think is a really good representation of the church, and you put people around us to love us and to help us heal and to help us to grow and to help us to mend, and you'll take care of it all. Help us, I pray. We look to you. We confess you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. 
God, be the forgiver of my sins. Be my Lord, my Savior. Help me follow you all the way through, I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, can we give the Lord a hand? <laughs> gotta go, gotta go. All right, prayer partners are in the back. Wave at us, prayer partners. Yeah, I love you guys. Thank you, guys. These people are awesome in prayer. They're here, they're there, and they'd love to pray with you if you want to be prayed for. And if you don't even want to go back there, you just hang out in your chair. They'll come find you. I promise you they will. A um, couple things. Um, if you want to give today, we don't pass buckets. There are, there's a box out there. There's kiosks over there. But I just want to say thank you because of you guys giving on our first, our, our big Wednesday, our missionary from Lithuania was here. It was like thirty six or $3,700 that you guys gave that we sent with him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. That's, that's, really, a, that's really a big deal. Thank you because every time you give, you're not giving to, you're giving through LifePoint Church. I hope you know that. We're going to do good stuff with it. We're going to make you proud, I promise you. Thank you so much for that. Hey, and group signups are happening today out, out there. If you haven't signed up in a group, you can do it there. You can do it at lifepointsa.com slash groups. They're launching this week. Can't wait to do life with you guys. Stand with me if you don't mind. Elbow, fist bump. Don't elbow anybody just like you can get, like whatever your deal is, whatever your jam is. Hey, you're blessed coming. You're blessed going. Let the favor of God be upon your life. We love you so much. Have an amazing week, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. God bless you. God bless you.